I'd like to thank you all for having me here today. It's a real pleasure. I'm uh, excited at the prospects for the really good work that can be done when community members such as yourselves and uh, academic researchers like me get together to try to solve problems. So um, thanks for having me and thanks for being here. Um, point it that way. Does anyone know what this is? Tower of Babel. This is the Tower of Babel. It's a famous collaboration that failed because <laughs> partners didn't speak one another's language. So I think you already have the point. Paul and Melinda have made it. That's really what we're here for is to try to avoid Tower of Babel type projects. So um, it, it's, it's, uh, projects are more effective when partners understand one another's language. And I'm here today to give you a glimpse. And that's the big qualifier. It's just a glimpse of um, what certain researchers think about and um, the certain kinds of problems and the certain kinds of approaches that a certain type of researcher might take in, uh, in trying to uh, answer, answer questions. So we're going to talk today about certain research methods that would be commonly used in a community setting. Um, we won't be talking about test tubes or microscopes or some of that T1 sort of research. We're going to be more on that right side of that transitional spectrum that Melinda just talked about. Um, we'll be talking about uh, research that uses surveys and interviews, healthcare data, community measures. And uh, even though we're going to cover quite a lot of stuff today in a pretty short time period, I do have one disclaimer, and that is that this presentation will not make you into a professional researcher. So um, ostensibly, this talk is about how to select a study design or a study type. If that one of those last slides that Melinda showed you had different steps in the process. And I, I don't think this presentation will bring you quite there. So my, my real hope is that what we'll be able to do today is give you some insight into the way researchers think. And we're going to spend maybe a, most of the time on some basic concepts that you'll see are pretty basic. It's really not rocket science. It's science, but it's not rocket science. It's kind of, you know, turbocharged common sense in a way. And uh, I want you to be able to take away some of these concepts because even though we may have fancy study designs for this and fancy study designs for that, a lot of it is really coming back to some pretty basic things. So uh, here's what I hope we will be able to do today is to give you a glimpse of how academic researchers think of problems and questions of interest. Uh, give you a taste, again, the operational word here is taste, of some of the research methods or tools that we use uh, when we work with communities, um, and to provide a foundation on which you can build that I hope will make it easier for you when you are working in partnership with academic researchers. So if there had been any mystery around this or if you'd even given it any thought before, I hope that uh, some of the mystery will, will go away. So the title of the talk has to do with uh, having a tool as a hammer, and what we're going to really try to talk about today is how different problems require different tools. Different tools are good for some problems. Sometimes the two can get mixed up a bit. So let's just go through and try to illustrate and maybe belabor that point. What tool would you like here? A hammer. Which tool would you like here? Okay, bottle opener. Would a hammer work? Okay, hammer might do the trick. You get the <laughs> bottle open. Okay, it might not be the best tool for the job, but it did work. So here, maybe a bottle opener. Better way to go. What's the tool here? Okay, right, a jack. What else could you use? You're a really strong person. In a previous, a previous version of this, I had Charles Atlas there lifting up a car. I took that out. So yeah, really strong person would be a good one. Any other ideas? Cell phone. Cell phone, great one. <laughs> Call a AAA. So it's a problem. It requires a tool. Different tools might solve that problem. And they have their relative advantages. Speed, cost, getting your sleeves dirty, different advantages. So that's the concept. Um, we as researchers have a toolbox. And we don't want to just have a hammer. We want to figure out what's, what's your problem, basically. And what's our problem? How, do we, how are we going to solve this? What's the best tool for the job? So. Let's um, take a look at what are some of the items in a researcher's toolbox. And again, this is a certain type of researcher. A lot of what we're going to talk about today uh, is based in the science of epidemiology. Epidemiology is, um, epidemiologists argue about how to define it, so don't hold me to this. But epidemiology is um, the study of different 
um, exposures and different characteristics and how they relate to disease in a population. So epidemiologists study groups of people. So we're going to um, spend our, our, our quite a bit of time with some basic terms and concepts. As I alluded to earlier, these are kind of the foundation of what the rest of this will be. So we're going to talk about something called association, and we're going to talk about exposure and outcome. This I hope you'll take away with you. Then we're going to talk about a category of study methods that are quantitative. Quantitative coming from quantity. So these are studies that rely on measuring with numbers, mathematical methods. And we're going to look at five different types. We're going to spend most of our time talking about these first two, descriptive studies and cross-sectional studies, to give you an idea, again, of the way that a researcher would be looking at these problems. And then we'll kind of flash through these to give you a flavor of the different ways that we might you know, approach uh, problems like this. And then finally, we'll talk about uh, qualitative methods very briefly. And these are methods that don't use numbers so much. Mostly are interested in information gathered from talking with people or observing people. So let's start by talking about association. What's association? Association is when you find things that are usually uh, found together, like, like Fred and Ginger. So where you see Fred, you often see Ginger. And um, so that's an association. Um, it doesn't mean, look, let's give some other examples, and we'll start getting some graphs here. So here's an association. We find that when more people are eating ice cream, so this graph, this would be the zero point, and along the bottom here, this represents more ice cream consumption. This would be the zero point, and as you move this way, it indicates more sunburn. So this graph would show, tell us that as more people are eating ice cream, more people are getting sunburn. So there's an association, ice cream consumption and sunburn. Another association, M when more people are eating ice cream, more people are having boating accidents. So interesting. When more people are eating ice cream, it turns out there are more shark attacks. <laughs> okay, we gotta get rid of all the ice cream. <laughs> okay, why? It's not causing it. It's so why, why do you want to get rid of the ice cream? Because it's, uh, there seems to be more shark attacks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what did you say? I said, but it's not the cause, it's the, just an association. Okay, did everyone catch that? That's the point here. The point is that association by itself doesn't mean <coughs> cause or a causal association. So it's a, this is a very important concept. But it's common for people to say, wow, we've got a lot of ice cream consumption, as you said. We've got to cut back on that. Maybe we'll save on shark attacks. Not likely. So what's the common factor here? Shark attacks, boating accidents, sunburn. It's summertime. So we're not going to talk about this today. We'll talk about it maybe, in, we will talk about it in a later talk. The but assumption is that you don't need ice cream in the winter, and that, I don't see that. Well, so now, is that the assumption? Maybe, maybe winter ice cream consumption is down here. So maybe there's still some shark attacks. I hear the ice cream stores do really good in the winter. There you go. Um, summertime is what we would call a confounder here. So we have a real association here, but it's not causal. The fancy word is causal, when one thing causes something else. So ice cream consumption associated with overweight. Interesting. This one might be causal. That's something we want to think about. So, uh, basic concept, basic word, association. A couple of other basic terms. One is exposure. So, as I mentioned, a lot of what we're talking about today comes from the science of epidemiology. And the traditional definition of exposure in epidemiology is sort of historically re related to, uh, to the practice of medicine and to d disease. So, tra traditionally, exposure is a state of contact with something. It could be a germ or an infectious agent, could be radiation, could be chemicals that may have a harmful effect. Um, the definition is you, or the idea of exposure is used in other contexts. So it's not always have to, it doesn't always have to be with medicine and disease. It could be any relevant characteristic, a habit, or a practice that may either increase or decrease the likelihood of a certain outcome. So it doesn't have to, an exposure doesn't always have to lead to something bad. An exposure could lead to something good. If I went back to the other graph, the other graph, you could say that increased ice cream consumption increases happiness. It does for me. So, so that's, that's an association, and it's a causal association in my case, but it's not a negative outcome. It's the happiness factor. So um, when we talk about exposure, we, we, we talk about something called an independent variable. These two things are, um, when, when, we, when we start talking a little bit more about 
um, how to analyze data and how, how, we, how we manipulate the numbers, this might make a little more sense in terms of what's independent. We'll get back to a graph and uh, I hope that that'll, um, that'll help understand that. Another basic uh, term is an outcome. So the traditional medical is uh, a disease that results from an exposure. But just like with the uh, definition of exposure, it doesn't have to be medical. So it could be any condition, it could be other than a disease, it could be a social economic events or circumstances. And again, um, the outcome could be a positive or a negative outcome, something desired or not desired. And outcomes, when we start to analyze this with numbers, <coughs> are referred to as the, de the dependent variable. So now you can start to put the two together. If you think about ice cream, ice cream is independent in a sense, I'm going to eat it or not. And whether or not obesity results from eating ice cream is the dependency. So the, 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 the weight gain depends on the ice cream. And that's why we refer to these as dependent and independent. So let's go back to our slide here. Um, uh, the ice cream consumption would be the exposure. The, out, the over, being overweight would be the outcome. And um, again, this is the independent variable as this goes up then this one changes accordingly. So this variable, in some ways, is dependent upon that variable. A fancy word variable from your algebra class that you may have skipped, um, or maybe not, is that a variable is something that can change. It doesn't have a set value. So ice cream consumption is something that is variable because it moves, you know, varies by person, may vary by season, um, etc. So back to exposure and outcome, it's another way of looking at the same problem and we're going to start to think of it in terms of these squares. Exposure can be, um, this would be the exposed group, those who are eating a high amount of ice cream. The non-exposed group, those who are eating a low amount of ice cream. So when we think about exposure, we can think about uh, how, how different people may or may not have that exposure. And here we've broken it into two categories, high and low ice cream consumption. So we can start to look at differences between people according to their exposure status. Some people don't like ice cream. They don't eat it at all. Some people eat a lot of it. There may be some interesting differences between them. So that's the way we start to think about exposure. Same with outcomes. Outcome here, it's not just whether you have it, that would be overweight in this example, but whether you don't have it, whether you're not overweight. So. Does everybody who eats a lot of ice cream get overweight? No. I, I, we all know people who seem to not put anything on. They can shove this stuff down. They don't get overweight. And uh, do all people who don't eat ice cream, are they all thin? No. So that's kind of the, the, the bread and butter, if you'll excuse the, the analogy, of what, um, of what uh, many researchers, especially epidemiologists, do. We're trying to figure out are more of the people who are exposed obese or overweight than the people who aren't exposed? Are more people who don't have this outcome likely to be exposed? We, we, we try to fill these boxes up and see how they compare. So every, some people who are exposed who have high ice cream consumption are going to have the outcome and some aren't. And similarly, some with low ice cream consumption are going to be overweight and some aren't. So here's the problem. Too many kids um, are, are overweight. And um, oh, one other thing I'd like to say about exposure and outcome before we move on. You're going to see this slide several times, I guess. Um, and that is that we, we, generally th we generally think of exposure and outcome in the context of a question. So Melinda was talking about a hypothesis. And we've set this up like this is the exposure and that's the outcome. But just setting it up this way doesn't mean that this relationship exists. Okay? It's a question. We're asking ourselves, does high ice cream consumption lead to overweight? And it makes sense to set it up this way. We wouldn't intuitively say that the exposure would be overweight. Does overweight lead to higher ice cream consumption? We might find that more people who are overweight are eating more ice cream. If we just looked at them, they might continue to do so. But we wouldn't think that there's a cause that way. So when we start to talk about exposure and outcome, it's kind of to set up the problem, much in the way you just said. We define an exposure for our purposes for how we're going to set up the problem. It's kind of what we do as researchers. We set the question up. We formalize the question so that we can then answer the question. So a problem is that too many of our kids are overweight. And um, this isn't really phrased as a researchable question. It's just sort of a problem. But within this problem are many potential researchable questions. And um, what I'd like to do is take you through a couple of hypothetical researchable questions to help you see some of the tools that we use as researchers. 
Um, you could start to answer a question like this using um, some of the, the lab methods that Melinda alluded to. You could do basic research in the laboratory on different hormonal mechanisms of obesity. You could look at genes. These are all things that affect obesity. The kind of stuff we're more likely to do in the community relates to working with people, working with um, uh, the kinds of data we talked about earlier. So this is what we're going to talk about next. These are some of the quantitative methods we talked about. Um, we'll start with descriptive studies and we'll spend a little bit of time talking about cross-sectional study because I think it gives you some insight as to how we analyze these relationships between exposures and outcomes. All of these studies, incidentally, except for possibly the descriptive study, are just trying to get at the relationship between exposure and outcome, but they're doing it through different ways. And they do it because maybe there are different data available, or maybe you're trying to answer, uh, maybe you're looking at the question with a different de definition of your exposure, so you need to use a certain study design. It's kind of like a couple of ways to fix that flat tire. Are we going to use the jack? Are we going to use the cell phone? Not quite sure which. So. Let's talk about descriptive studies. Here's the question. How many kids are overweight? What's the exposure? What's the outcome? It's not really an exposure and outcome in here, is it? It's really just, it's descriptive. We're asking for information to describe the way it is. So the way we set this up earlier, we had overweight as an outcome. It doesn't really make sense to have an outcome without an exposure, does it? So we don't really have an exposure in here. So as Jamie suggested earlier, as we were talking about, we want to define our population, so we want to decide which kids. So for our study design, let's say 10-year-old children in the county, very explicit about who we're interested in. What do we mean by overweight? We're going to measure the BMI, and we'll use a cutoff point, a standard cutoff point. And then our job is to calculate the per percentage of these 10-year-olds in the county who are overweight, they're above a certain BMI. So we're, this is, we're, we're not really looking at exposure in this case. We're not looking at a relationship between two things. And this is characteristic of a descriptive study. We could have asked the question, what proportion of people in the county eat a lot of ice cream? That would be a descriptive study as well. But it doesn't compare the exposure to the outcome. There's no comparison between the two. So we're going to take this, and we have 600 children in the study in the community, and we go out and we weigh them, and we measure their height, we calculate their BMI, and we find that using our definition of overweight, 180 of this 600 were overweight, and the rest, 420, were not overweight. So 180 subtracted from 600 is 420. So what percentage, that was our question we were trying to ask, trying to describe the percentage of overweight kids. And what percentage are overweight? It's the 180 divided by all. Of them. So it turns out to be 30%. So that's a, that's a basic idea of a descriptive study. We describe something. This could be very useful. It doesn't tell us about what might be causing the overweight, but it helps us to um, establish that there's a problem, perhaps. Maybe the next community over is only 20%. Maybe the national average is 15. Um, or maybe the national average is 40. This gives some idea of what you're starting with in your community. Let's talk about another type of study, cross-sectional study. This study will show something about the relationship between exposures and outcomes. A different question. Do overweight kids exercise less? So what's the, what's the exposure here? No, it might be, it's kind of right here for you. The exposure here is exercise. And as I'm looking at this, I'm seeing that this could actually go in both ways. And that's kind of why this is cross-sectional. This cross-sectional, as you'll see in a minute, doesn't really necessarily talk about which comes first or what the direction is. The outcome is overweight. And when we do a cross-sectional study, we get information on the supposed exposure and the supposed outcome at the same time. So we, we go out and we ask people, we, we, we're going to measure people's weight, and we're going to say, what's your current exercise? Okay, we're not really, we're not really, we, we can't really tell which of these things came first, but we think, for the purposes of our hypothesis and our question, that l exercising less, or lower exercise, may be associated with overweight. Associated, not necessarily causally. We don't know that yet. So, um, here's our study design. We're going to measure BMIs. That's body mass index. 
It's a measure of, a measure of one's uh, being overweight or not. And we're going to survey people about their current exercise level. So here's our exposure again. We're going to consider an exposure, just for this example, as exercising less than one hour a day. That's, we're calling this the exposure because our hypothesis is that low, low exercise may cause or be related to overweight. That's why we're calling that the exposure. Is that, is that clear? We, we're kind of making it up for our problem. And non-exposure would be one hour or more a day. We're going to have two categories of outcome, overweight and not overweight. Again, we'll define it by a certain BMI level. So I'm going to move these around a little bit. We're going to move the exposure category down here. We're going to move the outcome category up here. So this, these are those who are exposed. These are those who are not exposed. These are those who have the outcome. These are those who don't have the outcome. And we're going to turn it into a little square. Now, I've heard this two by two square referred to as the epidemiologist's worldview. So if you want, in a <laughs> nutshell, if you want to catch, you know, we saw that little picture with the guy's head open. This is all we're thinking about. It's not complicated. It's a little two by two square. And no matter how fancy the numbers get when they're doing all this research and they're talking about p-values, we're really trying to look at the relationship between exposure and outcome. And we set up this little two by two square because it helps us to sort the numbers out. So let's follow through this study that we did. We went out and we talked with 100 people for this hypothetical study. And we, we started by, by weighing 100 people. And so we found that 30 of the people were overweight. And so we put those people in this category, in this column of the, of the outcome. Again, cross-sectional study, outcome exposure, we don't know which leads which. So the other 70 were not overweight for a total of 100. Then we asked the people um, who were overweight about how much exercise they got. We found this. That 20 of those who were overweight said they exercised less than an hour a day, and 10 said they exercised for an hour or more a day. So not everybody who was overweight was, ex was a low exerciser. They didn't all have the exposure. But it looks like twice as many had the exposure, right? We did the same thing with people who were not overweight. And of the 70, 35 said they exercised less than, half, less than an hour a day, and 35 said an hour or more. So half and half. And then because we like to do this with the numbers and it comes in useful, we round the numbers out. So that this column, the 20 and the 10 add to 30, and this column, the 35 and 35 are 70. This is our categories for the outcomes, overweight and not. Of all the people who exercise less than an hour a day, there were a total of 55. 20 were overweight, 35 not. So what does this tell us? It tells us the relationship between these two, uh, between the exposure and the outcome. This kind of study does tell you something about the relationship. And we, we make a calculation. Here's our calculation. We ask ourselves, what proportion or what percentage of the, of the study people, of study participants who were overweight exercised less than an hour a day? Remember, our exposure is low exercise. So we take the 20 and we divide it by the total. And we find that 20 divided by 30, 66% or two-thirds of those who were overweight were getting low exercise. Over in this column, we did the same thing. This 35 is coming from here. It's not coming from there. It's 35 of the 35 who were getting less than an hour a day, 35 divided by the total of 70 is 50. So what does this tell us? Look at these numbers here. Someone want to tell me what is the conclusion you can draw from this cross-sectional study? Those that exercise less than an hour a day are more likely to be overweight. Okay. Or put another way, those who are overweight are less likely to exercise an hour a day. Does everybody see that? They, there are 66 percent, or they're 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 more likely to be low exercisers. Does that make sense? So. 66% of those who are overweight exercised less than an hour. Only 50% of those who are not overweight exercised less than an hour. So the difference here is between 66% and 50%. More people overweight getting less exercise. Now, when we talk about statistics later on, we'll figure out whether it makes a difference, 66 and 50%, because maybe that doesn't make a difference. What if this were 66 and this were 63? There's a difference but maybe it doesn't make a difference. 
we'll get to that at another talk. So cross-sectional studies like the one we just described have some advantages. They're pretty quick. They're pretty uh, inexpensive. You just go out and you get the information you need all at once. You don't have to follow people through time. You don't have to go back and look at a lot of information. The disadvantage is that you don't know what came first. So we didn't really ask them about the history of their exercise, how long did it go back. We just asked, what's your current exercise? So it's cross-sectional. We're just taking one moment in time. And because of that, we, don't, we can't tell about what we call a temporal relationship or a time relationship between the exposure and the outcome. It gets back to your very first question about the ice cream and the sharks. You know, we don't know if there's a causation there, but if one of them happens first, that helps us to understand if there might be some causation. All right, now we're going to go kind of quickly through three more study designs. I want to emphasize again that all three of these studies are getting at the very same sort of thing, relationship between an exposure and an outcome. But this time we're going to start seeing that time gets into it a little bit. A different question. Is playing video games associated with obesity in children? What's the exposure? Playing video games. Playing video games. Um, what's the outcome? In whom? Okay, so again, we want to know which children. We want to want to define that. We want to know what we mean by playing video games. How often? How much do you have to play? You know, is it 10 hours a day? Is it once a month? We need to come up with a cutoff. So it gets back to Jamie's question. And again, obesity, we want to define that. So in this case, with a case control study, the key element is that we're going to compare the study participants according to their outcome. We call them a case and a control. Case control study, we're going to say, we're going to be comparing those who are obese to those who are not obese. And, here's, and so we're going to identify all those kids who are obese, and we're going to identify kids who are just like them in all ways, except they're not obese. And we call them the controls. We're not going to go into this today, but trying to find kids who are like them in all ways, except being obese, that's the challenge in this kind of study. And then we'll get information about their prior video game exposure for the last two years. Okay? Here's the way it's set up. Exposure and outcome. But in a case control study, we're defining, we're defining them by the outcome. So we start over here. We find those who are obese and we say, tell us about your video game use. Some of them are going to have high video game use. And that's, we go back to our question, we're saying, we're, we're, our hypothesis, high video game use leads to obesity. Therefore, high video game use is the exposure. And so some of them are going to have high video game use, but not all of them. Same thing with those who are not obese. Some will have high video game use, but not all of them. And like the way the numbers sorted out, we're not going to go through it again, but the way the numbers sorted out with the cross-sectional study, we'll be able to figure out is the proportion who are obese that are on high video game use a higher proportion than those who are not? That's the essence of, a, of what's called a case control study. It's also kind of quick, relatively low cost, there are a couple of different disadvantages to this. One of the disadvantages is how you classify people. So suppose you took all of your cases, that's all of the kids who are obese, from a school that didn't have gym classes. And suppose you took all of your controls, the kids who aren't obese, from a school that does have gym classes. There's something there very important that's not similar to the, in these two groups. So when you're designing these studies, you know, don't try this at home, is what I'm trying to say. This is something you should understand about your research partners and learn as much as you can as you're working on studies with them. But it takes, uh, it takes, um, it takes some training and some, and some, uh, and some uh, familiarity with, with what's going on. Um, it's stuff that is very important for the community partners to understand and know about. The other issue, the potential problem here, is something called information bias. You're asking people to remember their video game use from two years ago might not be so accurate. You can have some problems along those lines. Okay, we're getting towards the end here. Cohort study is a, a study where you are comparing participants. Again, same relationship. You're interested in exposure and control. But here we're defining our study subjects according to their exposure status. We call them the exposed and the not exposed. So we're going to now we're going to start by identifying kids with high video game use and kids with low use. And now we're going to watch what happens through time. Now their video game use may change, so we're going we're to check up with them every so often, maybe every three months or six months. We're going to ask them about how much they're playing. And we'll ask them about other factors too. We might ask them about things that might affect obesity, like how much exercise they're getting, how much ice cream they're eating, 
things like this. So, um, and then we follow them for some time. And we, after three years in this particular example, we're going to measure um, their weight. And we're going to have measured their weight at the beginning. And we'll find out if, some, if that has led to obesity. So here's the design. Again, we have the same exposure group and we have the same outcome group. But here, and I shouldn't have called these cases here. So that's actually an error. And um, now this is going to be videoed for posterity, and they're all going to say, oh, he put the cases and controls there. But this should just be um, the outcome. So this should be outcome and non-outcome. So for a cohort study, the lingo doesn't really involve cases and controls, so my error. But it's designed in the other direction. That's the point. So a cohort study, you're moving forward in time. Case control, you know who's obese and not. You ask them to remember what the exposure was before. Here, we take the exposure and we walk it forward and we say, oh, what happens in time? Again, everybody who's a high game user isn't going to be obese and everyone who's um, a low game user is not going to be obese. It's going to split out. We're going to do the same kind of numeric analysis that we looked at before. So advantage is here. Um, the measure of the exposure is not biased. We can define how we're going to define our exposure, we can measure it. Give them a survey, we can do it every week if you want. We could, theoretically, you could set up a camera in the house and, or some monitor on the video game and you could get a very real measure of how much exposure they have. Um, different than case control where they're trying to remember back about the exposure. Here we do know about temporality, the fancy word for the relationship in time between the exposure and the outcome. Because we measure everybody at the beginning to see if they're obese. We see who develops obesity as we go forward. And we can also measure multiple outcomes. So we could measure, in addition to obesity, we could look at their grades in school, how well they're doing in school. We could look at um, their uh, improved computer skills. So there could be a lot of other things you could look at, multiple outcomes, when you follow this forward, if that makes sense. Big disadvantages to a cohort study. This might not be the right way to change your tire, you know, um, because it's timely. It takes a lot of time and cost. And there's a loss to follow up, which means that some kids might move out of town. They might decide they don't want to play anymore. There's a lot of reasons that you might lose people in this study. It's a good study. I mean, it's a good study design, um, and it gives you um, some more solid information than other study designs. But it, it's, quite, it's a demanding type of study to do. Okay, this is the second to the last study design. Everybody's still with me, I hope. This is the last one that we're going to talk about that looks at the relationships between exposures and outcomes. It's called a randomized trial. Sometimes people call it a randomized control trial. Some people think you don't need both words. I'm one of those. The question is, um, does teaching parents how to motivate their children to exercise work? So is, there are some programs about, about uh, teaching parents uh, different ways to motivate their kids to exercise for a their age-appropriate motivation. And the question that we're asking is, do, do those programs work? So to do this kind of study, we would define our study population. So our study population might be, and th this, is, this is a true experiment. Now that's, that's the thing I should say. It's going to be similar to a cohort study, but it's a true experiment. Um, we're going to define our study population. So it might be um, the parents of uh, uh, 10-year-olds, again, just to stick with that. We want to make it as precise as possible. And then we as researchers are going to assign the, stu the, the, the study subjects into what we could call an exposure and a non-exposure category. We don't really use those terms in a randomized controlled uh, trial. It would be the treatment group or the non-treatment group or the comparison group. But it's the treatment is very similar to the exposure in a cohort study. The only difference is we aren't just watching what's happening naturally with free-ranging humans. Okay? We're actually doing something to them. We're saying, you guys are going to get the treatment. In this case, it's a teaching program. And we're saying, you other guys aren't going to get the treatment. And then we, um, we handle both groups the same. Uh, we handle the comparison group the same except for the treatment. So we don't want to do anything different with them. And then we measure the changes in the amount of exercise. So it looks very similar. Like I said, it's not rocket science. Here we have what we call a treatment in this case, which is an education program. It's kind of like an exposure, except that the investigators or the researchers are making these decisions about who's going to go where, and they're doing it randomly. Okay, they're not saying, hmm, they look like somebody who would really follow the program. I'm going to put them in the treatment group. They should, ideally, they shouldn't know. They should be picking numbers out of a hat, so to speak, although they do it in a different way than that. So these folks get the treatment. These folks don't. We call it a placebo or a comparison group. And then, just like the other study, we watch what happens. Of those who got the treatment, 
Did it increase their kids' exercise? Did the education program increase exercise? It's going to do it in some cases, maybe, and not in others. And similarly, some of the comparison folks, for reasons we might not know or understand, are going to have kids whose exercise increases and others aren't. We'll do a similar kind of analysis. Advantages here, when you do this randomization, the flip of the coin or the pulling the number out of the hat, what it means is if you have large enough numbers, if you have enough people in the study group, that the two groups should be the similar or they should be the same in all factors that you can see and factors you can't see. So it helps to make sure that you're really looking at the effect of your treatment and that you're not looking at differences between the groups, like the one I mentioned. Well, here's a group that, for whatever reason, maybe they have better education, maybe they live closer to an exercise facility. Other reasons that might, in this case, lead to increased exercise. The disadvantages, even more than most cohort studies, although that's not always the case, usually it's more timely and costly, and they're, they're pretty complex to do. So again, it's back to the tire changing. Which tool do you want for this job? You have to make those decisions. You like those? They have a, that one. Uh, yeah, yeah. They have a. They have, they're very clean. Some people would call them the gold standard in research, but it really depends on the question you're asking. Okay, it's not always the gold standard, um, but uh, it's uh, traditionally it is, and for certain kinds of studies, it clearly is. So we've talked so far about quantitative research using data based on numeric measurements, mathematical methods. This is quantitative, coming from quantity these numbers. It's the two-by-two two tables we talked about. I'm very briefly going to talk about another type of research that often complements quantitative research. It's called qualitative. And the root word here is quality. It doesn't mean quality necessarily as good or bad, but what's something about? And it uses data based on focus groups or interviews or, or just the observations of the researchers. So here's a problem. We added healthful options at the school cafeteria. We put some healthful food on the cafeteria line. And then we did a quantitative study. We, m we measured. And we found that a minority of kids were choosing these items more than twice a week. Okay? So we found that 6 to 8-year-olds were choosing these items t more than twice a week. Only 32% of 6 to 8-year-olds, 24% of 9 to 11-year-olds were choosing the healthful items more than twice a week. And only 13% of the 12 to 14-year-olds. So why weren't they choosing them? hard to tell from the numbers, isn't it? The numbers don't really give you the whole story here. Now, there seems to be a trend. The older you get, the less likely you are to choose them, but it still doesn't tell us why. And it's hard to imagine how you could answer that with more numbers. Now, if you knew a lot about why kids choose certain things to eat, you could set up a survey maybe, and you'd have a starting point. But if you didn't know anything about why they choose things to eat, you need to find out. And so a qualitative study might be the answer. So. What helps kids choose healthful alternatives in the cafeteria? A qualitative study would go in and observe the cafeteria. Researchers, often anthropologists, would take field notes, observe what's happening. They might do interviews with the students, with the cafeteria staff, with the parents, try to get some insight. Um, they would rec we would typically record these interviews. So you do the interviews, you don't just get an idea, you actually record them, they get transcribed, and then researchers will read these transcripts and you'll get multiple researchers who go through and analyze the transcripts and they try to come up with some agreements on this. So you might find that there were certain themes here like peer pressure that wouldn't come out when you measure it. Somebody says, ah, you know, I kind of like eating an apple, but I get teased, maybe especially the 12-year-olds. Um, the cafeteria staff might uh, have some insights about, well, it depends where you put it. Put it in the front end of the line, the tail end of the line. So this is just a flavor of qualitative research. Sometimes it's the best and only method. Sometimes it uh, isn't the right method. Sometimes it works well together with the kinds of quantitative studies we just described. So as I promised, this is just a... Um, a, a, a scratching of the surface. I hope it makes you feel more comfortable with some of the ways that researchers might think and that it might, um, at the very least, be kind of a good conversation starter for you. You'll learn more as you work with researchers on your actual projects, and that's what I encourage you to do.